and the historic Métis community. Um, really acknowledging that we're all zooming in from all across the land and acknowledging the forever history of this land and the ties of Indigenous people to the land. Uh, so thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we're really pleased to welcome Dr. Aaron Millions and Dr. Mary Jane Logan McCallum from the University of Winnipeg to discuss the photographic history of tuberculosis in Indian commu Indigenous communities in Manitoba. So thank you so much, both Aaron and uh, Mary Jane for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Ninda Shinzi, Mary Jane Logan McCallum, Nino Giai Nalahi, Shokwiki in Winnipeg. Nawa Lotaman Wendak Tekwa. Um, thank you to Krista uh, McCracken for inviting us uh, to present today. My name is Mary Jane Logan McCallum, and I'm a band member of the Muncie Delaware Nation. Uh, Muncie is located upriver on the Thames River in southwestern Ontario, and uh, a neighboring community to the Chippewa of the Thames, which is where um, uh, Mount Elgin Residential School was located. Uh, so it was one of the earliest industrial schools, along with uh, you know the earlier version of Shinguak. Um, and uh, it was called Mount Elgin. I'm a descendant of um, students from uh, Mount Elgin and from um, Mohawk Institute. So there are Logans and Youngs. Uh, so thanks to everyone for tuning in today to um, listen uh, to us speak about our history project. Um, and I want to say a special hello um, in my language, Lenape, uh, Quinganewal, to um, Indian residential school survivors and their descendants who are listening. Aaron and I are uh, both in Winnipeg, um, in Métis, Cree, and Anishinaabe territory, um, and a place that is part of both the Treaty One um, and the Manitoba Act. And we um, we make meaning of the history of tuberculosis in relation to the land and the people who live here. Uh, so part of our work is about holding the state accountable for historic and ongoing racism and inequities in the healthcare system. Um, part of it is also about making meaning of Indigenous histories with state-run institutions in ways that serve sovereign First Nations communities and people. So I don't see those two um, things as inherently conflicting goals. Um, although it's hard to do both at the same time because you're often addressing different people with different um, types of knowledge and, and different sorts of um, historical evidence. Um, so our key resource that we use um, that we wanna talk about today is historical photographs of uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit TB patients. These are important archives uh, that document unequal treatment in unequal systems. Um, they're also important evidence of health and of social history and family history and community history. So the Shingwa Project Residential School Photo Album Series, Remember the Children, is a kind of case in point of the same kind of work that we're doing here. So Aaron and I are aiming to increase the accessibility of photographs to Indian hospital survivors and families, and to identify the individuals in the, in the photos themselves. Uh, so my part today is to provide a little bit of background about the history of, um, of TB treatment for First Nations people, um, Inuit people and Métis in Manitoba. Um, and I'm gonna just do that by discussing the similarities between the residential school system and um, the Indian hospital system as it kind of unfolds in Manitoba. So the parallels between the history of hospitalization and the history of um, education for First Nations people. Um, so in Manitoba. So um, Aaron, if you could move that forward uh, a little bit, just one slide there. Oh, there it went forward a little bit further than I thought. Um, talking about TB that's treatment, okay. yep, that's the one, um, it is uh, sanatoriums I'm talking about, so specialized um, 
kind of hospitals for TB treatment. And in Manitoba, the long, longest standing one, uh, probably the most famous one is called Ninet. It's in Western Manitoba. It opened in 1910 and closed in 1972. Um, and that was largely closed to First Nations patients until the disease came under control among um, white people in Manitoba. And then those beds opened up and First Nations people were allowed to go. So it was a largely racially segregated treatment for TB. Um, it is in the front, it's really, really pretty. It's right along the lake and um, you eat really well and, and you rest a lot and you recover that way from TB. Um, but there were some in cities as well. There's one in, um, uh, in Winnipeg here called the St. Boniface Sanatoria. That building still exists. And um, it had a, uh, an annex or a separate pavilion for uh, First Nations people, uh, people's treatment in the city of Winnipeg. And then if you could go one more, Aaron, um, um, there's a couple of hospitals that were distinctly called Indian hospitals. And, and uh, uh, organized uh, Federal Board of Manitoba in, in Manitoba here, uh, right is, and the bottom is Brandon Sanders. Mary, Those are the we're just, talking about. You were freezing up a bit. Mary Jane, you froze up just a little bit. Can you back up a little bit in what you were saying? I wonder if I take my video. It's not better. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better now. You can hear me. We can hear. Okay, me. you can hear me. You're good. You're good. <laughs> Go. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, some similarities with residential school history. Um, in both cases, individuals were relocated to these institutions. Uh, they faced immediate, um, short-term and long-term uh, social, cultural. Uh, psychological, economic, and other trauma um, in those removals. And uh, some became completely alienated uh, from mainstream kind of healthcare and education as a result of, of their treatment in, in these institutions. Uh, hospitals like schools were often located at a distance from home communities and ice and so those patients were isolated from their family language and community and there's a map that we have of, of where these hospitals are um, and you can get a sense that these are you know these are in three institutions in a very large province of um, first nations communities that are that are um you know located all over uh, first nations from northwestern manitoba were highly regimented and they followed a strict daily routine that um, ranged from complete uh, and total bed rest through grades of permitted activities. So hospitals like residential schools ran on the principle that Indian education and health services should both cost less um, than those services, those education and health services delivered to non-First Nations people, so white settlers. So they, they, they had an economy, right? Uh, that they were supposed to be cheap. Uh, institutions that, um, they, they, both these institutions ran on a per diem basis, right? So the, the problematic funding pattern that relied on the kind of weakest link in the system, that is the um, incarcerated patients and students themselves and their ability to, uh, and the ability of staff um, to recruit them to those institutions, right? So th this is a really problematic model of funding. Um, at both, staffing was a problem, um, contributing to difficult work environments and added stress that could, under certain, certain circumstances, lead to abuse and substandard care. Uh, this have compared to prisons. Um, and at both, uh, there are histories of runaways and laws um, and procedures for preventing and catching and disciplining uh, runaways. Some students um, attended both residential schools and 
um, Indian hospitals. Uh, some that we have spoken to recall much better treatment at Indian hospitals than at the schools, in particular, better meals um, and obviously like uh, a, a relief from the forced labor um, of, of being in a residential school. Um, at the same time though, TB patients endured a regi regime of needles and pills and surgery uh, later on after the, um, after the 40s, uh, especially like the antibiotics and, uh, and also forced rest. At both institutions, there's a kind of goal of assimilation. We, we, we think at hospitals that, that uh, the main goal is recovery, like a biological recovery. Um, but uh, many of the individuals who worked in these hospitals felt that there was a kind of social recovery that was supposed to be happening as well. It was a, supposed to facilitate a change um, in First Nations patients there as well. Um, so, as you can see, there, there are also uh, some systemic kind of connections between these two as well. And this map here, you can see the early TB surveys. Um, this is when the Senate test people. So they tested them through x-rays. They used residential schools as tests for, um, oh no, residential schools as places for testing, for surveying, uh, and and then for, for removing um, patients to TB SANS. Um, we learned that uh, through, the, through our work with TB, but also through the, the research related to the, um, to the TRC, that TB accounts for just less than 50% of the recorded deaths of Indian residential school students. So there is that connection as well. Um, the sanatorium board um, doctors who worked in these hospitals created explicit guidelines on how to treat residential school students who had active cases in the schools. Um, so they're supposed to have less labor, they were supposed to have better diets. Um, and then they, they would just re-examine them sort of, uh, you know, sometimes uh, twice or three times a year. This is before we knew about um, the dangers of like radiation, the way that they were doing x-rays at the time. Um, so we do see plenty of, uh, of connections here. Um, like uh, I've, I've come to this project with a little bit more background in residential school history than in health history, but I, I just remark constantly at how many ways those two histories connect. And so I wanna, I wanna stop there and turn things over to Erin so she can talk more directly about the photos project that we're working on. Great, thanks Mary Jane. Um, we missed a slide here. Did you want that slide? Sure, just, uh, what is it here? Uh, rehabilitation. Oh no, yeah, you can just get that. Okay. That's fine. All right. Um, just give me one moment here to do some fancy work on some fancy stuff here so I can have these both up. Okay. Um, So first of all, thank you to uh, Krista for um, inviting us. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, and particularly to talk about the connections between the schools and the hospitals, because Mary Jane and I talk about this all the time. Um, and it also it comes up a lot in the, in the stories that hospital survivors have been telling us. Um, so first of all, I just want to talk a bit about why are we here talking about Indigenous tuberculosis history um, for, a, for an archive that's dedicated to residential school history. So as Mary Jane has pointed out, there's close connections between the schools and the hospitals, um, and they were part of the same assimilative uh, government programs and were structured very similarly. Uh, and when we talk about, when we talk to survivors, and, and this is illuminated in the TRC report too, but when you look at students' life histories, um, you see them moving back and forth between the schools and the hospitals often. Um, and so just looking at the residential school history and just looking at the hospital history doesn't necessarily illuminate how those life histories were working for students. Secondly, we're here because Indian hospitals are the next wave of settlements. And part of our work is responding to requests from survivors uh, to speak about tuberculosis history in that context. So the trend in settlements since the original 
Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement uh, has been for smaller and more limited compensation, thinking about the day school settlement and the 60 scoop settlement. Hospital survivor clash action suits are currently in progress. We have no connection to these um, suits other than to know that they are ongoing. And in terms of the histories of Indian hospitals, it's important that these settlements that are coming acknowledge um, the scope of the harm done the healing work that's required, but also um, long-term medical issues that may impact survivors um, from receiving underfunded and substandard medical treatment in the hospitals when they were patients. So this means that hospital settings that are coming need to be more in line with that of the IRSSA. And our project points to the scope of the research that's still to be done and the range of records um, that tell Indigenous histories or tell histories of Indigenous TB uh, in, in one province. Um, so here is just um, and some samples of the photos that we work with. The photos range from about the 1940s to the 1960s. Most of them seem to be from the 1950s. Um, in almost all of the photos, if there is a white nurse, a white teacher, a white doctor, they are named. So somebody has written in pencil on the back of the paper or on the back of the photo, um, the name of the white teacher or the white doctor, but almost none of the Indigenous patients or staff in the photos are named. Um, we also often don't know which hospital the photos are even from um, or the dates that the photos were taken. So here's some of the more um, medically focused photos. For this one right here shows the TB survey that Mary Jane was talking about. This is a child being x-rayed. Um, by one of the mobile for, uh, survey teams. Um, and then this slide shows uh, images from the schools that were in the hospitals. So there was students went to school in the hospitals, both um, these are all, these are younger children here. These are young adults up there. These girls here are doing their school work um, in bed with, with lap trays. And, and when uh, survivors look at these photos, they often comment first on the beds, both residential school survivors and hospital survivors, that the, the beds are very similar. And then on these lap trays, they remember, remember the, the physicality of those lap trays. So our, our, our project, the Manitoba Indigenous Tuberculosis Photo Project is centered around these historical photos. Um, the photos that we work with so far that are the from the core of our photo collection um, are from the private collection of the Manitoba Lung Association. And the Manitoba Lung Association is now the public facing body of the Manitoba Sand Board. The Manitoba Sand Board uh, still technically exists, although they are working on having um, uh, the, um, the bill rescinded. Um, so Mary Jane came across these photos uh, when she was doing some, some research at the Lung Association, and she found them in the cement damp dark cement basement of their, their office building. Um, they were just piled into cardboard boxes, uh, unsorted and uncatalogued. And the, the entire photo collection itself of the, of the Sandboard slash Lung Association um, goes from the founding of Ninette in, in the early 1900s through to the end of the Lung Association's asthma camps in the 1990s. So what we did is we went through the photos and we picked out the photos where where the few where the hospitals are identified, where the patients are identified. But for the most part, we had to guess um, and go by choosing the photos where we could visibly identify 
indigenous patients and stuff. And clearly that is not an accurate or scientific method at all. But when most of the photos are undated, don't tell us where they were from and don't name the patients, um, it was the best we can do. And as part of our uh, work this summer, we're going to go back and go through all the photos again see if knowing what we know now after working on the project for a couple of years if um, if we can identify additional photos so this project initially began um, as a six-month social media project to make the photos accessible to survivors and community because as part of a private archive they were invisible and inaccessible um, which effectively made these patients invisible from the histories of health history and indigenous history, and the records were, were inaccessible. So, so I, we had planned on just six months social media sharing the photos, um, and, and it, it turned into something else. So uh, we do have an indigenous advisory committee um, that is comprised of survivors, family members, and stakeholders from various um, Indigenous or stakeholder organizations. And what they asked us to do is, instead of limiting our scope to a six-month social media project, was to take the photos out into the communities. And so we said, okay, and we started working on, on doing that. Um, and to do that, we've, we've built... Um, quite an extensive range of uh, partners and research collaborators. This is uh, one of our, our lovely elders here, uh, former nurse Ruth Christie, um, to do this. Because this is not a project we can do alone. It requires partnerships and collabor collaboration with a wide range of survivors, um, family members, communities, stakeholders, and we continue to build these relationships as we go along. So we launched uh, our project um, in September 2019 at the National uh, Gathering of Elders. And if anybody in the audience was at the National Gathering of Elders in Winnipeg in 2019, you might recognize this photo, you might have stopped by. We did this in partnership with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, so they brought their residential school photos we did it in partnership with the Archives of Manitoba. And the Archives of Manitoba hold most of the hospital and administrative records from the um, sound board. Those records have been transferred over, um, but the photos remained in the basement. And also with the Hudson's Bay Company Archive um, Naming and Knowledge Project, which is their project to name unidentified Indigenous peoples um, in photos in their collection. Uh, so the, the gathering for us, the event was a huge success. Um, most, you know, overwhelmingly the feedback we got was that, that people were thankful um, that we were doing this work. We were able to identify some of the people in the photos and repatriate uh, copies of the photos back to um, families. Sometimes we sent people away with 10 copies of the, the photos so they could hand it out to their mom and their brothers and, and their sisters. Uh, we got some media coverage and word uh, began to spread about the project. And I think that this event also sort of set the tone um, of, of where we were going to be going with the project. We had always intended for it to be community um, led and Indigenous centered. But um, when we had to think through the logistics of, of how this was actually going to work and really center elders um, and, and, and uh, elderly people, the way that we needed to meet their needs, uh, it, it really set the tone of how we were going to proceed, that we were going to shape what we were doing to fit what the community wanted uh, and needed from us. So as word spread about our project, uh, we, the requests started rolling in. And honestly, the response um, was fairly overwhelming. We were not at all expecting the sort of response that we had. We got requests um, from uh, primarily uh, conferences and 
and events at first. So we went to the WHO settlement conference at the First Nations University in Regina to speak about sort of a little bit what we're talking about today, the, the hospitals as the, the next settlement that's coming down the road. We were asked by the NCTR's survival circle to come and speak at the Mamakwendan uh, gathering about tuberculosis as it relates to residential schools. Um, we were asked to go to Pegwas First Nation to speak as, at their residential school healing days and, and in all of these to bring our photos along um, for people to look at. We also started to get uh, requests coming in to travel to individual communities. And we were actually able to um, secure $25,000 grant to go on what we called our Northern tour of about four Northern communities. Um, but unfortunately that was supposed to happen in summer 2020 and it got shut down due to COVID. One of the other programs that we ran that was hugely successful was Indigenous Afternoons in the Arc. And, and program that was designed to support primarily um, research by Indigenous patrons in the archive on Indigenous history. I'm not going to talk a lot about that right now, but it was very popular. And in choosing this photo here, which was from, it's from the uh, archive, the Hudson's Bay Company archives, three out of these four women were named that were previously unnamed in this photo by putting it on our poster and sharing the poster for the program. So that was pretty cool. So what, what have we learned? Um, so the, this is what our photo books look like when we take them out. They, they are fairly large. I think they're about 11 by 16 or something like that. Um, they have the photo, whatever information we know about the photo. People can write in if they recognize the person, if they recognize the institution, if this triggers some some knowledge they might know about these photos and they can share it with us here and we fold that into our database um, about the photos. So what have we learned? So when we were heading into our first event at the National Gathering of Elders uh, in September 2019, we we didn't really know what to expect, um, but from our perspective, we were there to share our photos and see if we could have, see if community members could name some of the people in the photos. And, and then subsequently, if we could share, share photos back to people who recognized individuals. So that's, you know, from our perspective, that's what we were there for. Um, there was Mary Jane and myself and our, our two uh, uh, First Nations research assistants. Um, who are amazing uh, and part of the success that we had, large part of the success we had at the gathering um, was because of their work. They, they took, we were, our, our exhibit was in a building that was connected to but separate from the gathering and they took our photos out into the um, building where the convention was and went around and showed them to people and talked to people um, and uh, they were they were in large part uh, responsible for all of the people that then came over to the the, the exhibit to see the photos. Um, so one of the things that we sort of expected going into the gathering was that the value of survivor testimonies, sort of if you, if you think about residential school survivor testimonies gathered as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, you know, is fairly common, accepted, like if you if you say to people who who would be there viewing these photos, you know, residential school testimonies, people people understand what those are. And we assumed that that familiarity and that level of, I don't know if comfort is the right word, but but um, that we know what what the purpose of these is, um, would transfer over to hospital survivor testimonies as well. And that, was, that has not been true at all. And I'll talk about that um, in a bit. Something else that we did not expect was the extent to which the photos would serve as points of storytelling. Um, so like I said, at the gathering, our intent was to share the photos, um, share a little bit of the history of the segregated hospitals and, and 
have community members um, identify people if they knew people. And we have been uh, successful at identifying some of the people. But what happened that we didn't expect was that people began to talk to us about their hospital experiences as they sat and they flipped through the photo books. Several of them told us that they were speaking their truths about the hospitals out loud to us for the very first time. Um, and that is something we were not expecting for, we were at all. The, the four of us were not expecting or equipped for that level of trauma being shared with us. Um, the NCTR had had uh, culturally appropriate health support people on, on hand. So those people were there to support um, the survivors who were telling us their stories. But um, I think at the end of the three days, all four of us just went home and and cried because we just were not prepared for that. We weren't expected. We weren't expecting that. So that's something we we learned. And now we make sure there's always cultural support or cultural health support people um, on hand whenever we take the photos out. Um, we also, something that we learned is that there is a pressing time issue at hand here. So most of the hospital survivors um, that we've spoken to, all of them that I've spoken to personally, were children when they were in the tuberculosis hospitals. The oldest one that I've personally spoken to was 15 when she was in the hospital. So as far as I know, there has been no um, large scale project to collect testimonies or memories or histories from um, segregated hospital survivors. So we've already, you know, we've already lost the generations in large part that were adults in, in the hospitals. And so if we want to have those survivors tell us their stories, if they, if they want to share them, um, there's, there's a time issue at hand here. So what else have we learned? Uh, we learned that the community value placed on residential school testimonies has not transferred over to hospital testimonies. People are just not talking about histories of tuberculosis uh, in their families yet, from what people are telling us. Um, there's still a stigma attached to tuberculosis. And so either it's been trauma that is buried or, or um, it's just a topic that's not talked about for whatever reason. Um, these histories are not being shared in, in families and communities yet. Um, so what, what is happening is we have survivors coming and telling us their stories and in the same, in the same space, they're telling us that their stories don't matter. Um, and so we, you know, we always reinforce that their stories, their stories matter, what happened to them mattered. Um, but, but there's some work there to be done um, with survivors and in communities. Um, beyond this, survivor and family testimonies reveal four recurring themes. The first is that, um, as Mary Jane has talked about, their, their recollections highlight the ways that schools, hospitals, and the child welfare system all work together. So um, TB was one of the ways that children were removed from homes, either to send them to the um, hospitals or as child welfare options. So sometimes children were sent to residential schools if their primary care provider was sent to the hospitals or they were put into the child welfare system. We've also learned um, more about the experiences of children of TB patients. Um, and particularly the trauma of abandonment that they experienced. And this is almost what all of them speak about that have spoken to us so far, is the feelings of abandonment when their parent or parents sometimes went off to the hospitals and sometimes they came back and sometimes they didn't. Um, and, and how that trauma of abandonment has, has stayed with them. Um, and finally, um, we've learned that there is a very strong sense among hospital survivors who have spoken to us that medical experiments were conducted on them. 
Um, they often, you know, the, the space that we're in is, is often a public space. There's other places about, um, so that they, they're not telling us a lot of detail about this oftentimes, but they, there is this very strong sense in many of the testimonies, belief that medical experiments were conducted on them in these, in the hospitals. Um, and we've also learned that survivors and their families are really want this research done. There's a movement among academics um, and, and Indigenous researchers to not explore Indigenous trauma or to not center Indigenous trauma. And there are certainly very good arguments for, for that. Um, but in this case of the hospital histories of the segregated hospitals and in uh, survivors and families are telling us that they want this research done and that they want it shared with them. Um, and I think I'll stop there so that we can have some questions. Thank you.